Good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Brown with the Office of Communications, and welcome to NASA headquarters. Today's science update will feature new theories concerning Jupiter's icy moon Europa, more specifically, hidden lakes on Europa. In fact, what you will hear today opens up compelling possibilities in the search for life elsewhere in the universe. And the findings I publish in the journal Nature. We're going to have brief presentations from our speakers, then we'll open it up for questions starting here in Washington, our NASA centers, and our phone line. Before we get started, let me introduce you to today's speakers. First up, Brittany Schmidt, postdoctorate fellow, Institute for Geophysics, University of Texas at Austin. Tom Wagner, program scientist, Biospheric Sciences, Earth Science Division, NASA headquarters. Tori Holler, astrobiologist and senior research scientist, NASA's Ames Research Center, Moffett Field, California. And Louise Proctor, planetary scientist at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory in Lower Maryland. So let's get started, and I'll toss it over to Brittany. Thanks, Dwayne. Well, I'm excited to be here with you today to tell you a little bit about an icy moon of Jupiter called Europa, um, which we will show today evidence um, from recent work um, that my team has done. Um, my team, Don Blankenship, uh, Wes Patterson, and Paul Schenk and I um, have worked really hard uh, on this project. And if to put, Jupiter, or to put Europa in a little bit of context, this is an image of Europa. If you were to look up into the night sky tonight, much like Galileo did 400 years ago, you would see the brightest point of light in the sky is actually Jupiter. And if you looked at it with binoculars or a small telescope, you'd notice four tiny bright flashes of light. And these are the Galilean satellites. Of these, Europa is the second most, or second innermost moon and the first icy moon of Jupiter. Europa is covered by a thick layer of ice uh, containing a subsurface uh, ocean and then a deeper rocky mantle and possibly iron core. We're excited about Europa because it represents a place that's somehow alien and yet strangely familiar and may be a place where there's existence of life in the solar system today. And so um, I'm excited to tell you about lakes on Europa. Um, so if I could have the first graphic. Um, these are two images of geologic terrain taken by the Galileo spacecraft. And they show what's called chaos terrain. These are broken up regions of the surface characterized by a hummocky brown textured material we call matrix and large icebergs in many cases, which you can see in both of these images. Um, one of the motivations for this study was to try to understand why are these two features so similar and so different. Um, on the left, you're seeing Thera Macula, and on the right, you're seeing Connemara Chaos. Connemara Chaos is, in fact, perhaps the archetype of chaos terrain and gives us a picture of what Europa's activity may have looked like. And it's been thought for some time that this represented the interaction of ice and water. But how that, mo how that actually works out has been, has, has needed more explanation. And so uh, we went to work uh, on trying to understand this. And so the way that we gave perspective to the problem of chaos formation on Europa was to look at environments on Earth where water and ice interact. These two important analogs or examples of this process here on Earth are subglacial volcanoes and collapsing ice shelves. And so in a subglacial volcano, essentially what you have is a heat source underneath a thick cover of ice. And what it does is to create localized melt that actually forms a lens-shaped uh, lens lake just below the surface of the ice. What's interesting about that is that the water kind of sits there and gets to interact with the ice above. In Antarctica, we see great examples of collapsing ice shelves. And what these ice shelves do is they sit there for millions of years and then fill up with fractures and then break under their own weight or with help from the water that gets into fractures in those environments. And so with that context, we formulated a model for how Europa might work. 
So I'm going to show you a little demonstration before I show you an image. So if you imagine that we start off with Europa basically made up of ice that's fractured, um, but basically just sitting there. And then we add some water. This water comes up from below. It's, caused, it's melting that's caused by a plume of material, much like a mantle plume on the Earth, coming up underneath this brittle ice and filling it up with water. As the lake forms, you actually start to see the icebergs float. You notice that these have been turning around and rotating in the glass. In the case of Europa, there's also a thick material called matrix material that's crushed up ice um, that sits also on the surface of the water. So you never have liquid water really on the surface, but the water is actually causing the icebergs to float and rotate and to break up the ice around it. And what's interesting is that if you were to go back and look at this particular lake on Europa, much later, it would actually be frozen out and maybe resemble something like this, where you've got icebergs and matrix material pushed up, but the entire thing frozen out. And so um, in the next slide, we have an image of what that process might look like. It's just a cartoon image. On the left, we're showing a collapsing lake with icebergs popped up above the surface and, a, and the matrix material starting to fill up with salt-rich water from the lake below. Um, this is the process that breaks up the surface and causes it to look the way we think it does. Um, on the right-hand side, we see a snapshot of this process much later, once the ice or once the water in the lake has actually frozen out. One of the interesting observations of Europa has been that there are chaos features that are dropped down below the surface and chaos features that are perched up above the surface with these mm -hmm. dome-like textures. They always have in common some icebergs or some broken up material, but one's down and one's high. And what this does is to put those in perspective as kind of like a time scale. Drop down means active today with a liquid water lens and frozen out is popped up above the surface with domes and, and, and solid icebergs. And so if you go to the next slide, this is that first image that I showed you of the two chaos terrains. But in fact, in this case, we're showing you the topography overlaid on top of the image. In this image, blue means low and red means high. If you look at the image on the left, which is theromacula, you'll notice that the center of the feature is depressed down below the surface. In fact, as much as 400 to 800 meters, mm -hmm. which means that a giant pocket of liquid water still exists below this body today. What's also interesting is just like in this glass of water, the icebergs are popped up above the surface. If we look on the right image of Connemara Chaos, you'll notice that instead the terrain is much lumpier and it's characterized by this reddish color, which means that the surface is popped up and it's filled with water and then frozen. And so on the left, we have an active feature. On the right, we have an older feature that had a lake at one time, but might have already frozen out today. We've also prepared a video for you of the pro how the process might look on Europa. So we're going to show you that. Um, as we come into the video, you're going to see uh, we're flying by Jupiter, zooming into Europa, that second, second moon of Jupiter, covered with ice. And we're snapping into a thin section. So you can see, in fact, the process start to happen. If you notice, there's warm ice down from the bottom uh, right near the ocean interface, moving its way up causing warming and causing melting, kind of right in the middle of the ice shell. As that lake starts to form, it brings the surface down because water takes up less volume than the ice it replaces. So the surface collapses down, the icebergs start to float around, break up the ice around it, and then as it refreezes, it's free to dome back up and create the features that we see today that look like Connemara chaos. So this is, in fact, what we think it might be like on Europa um, as these features are forming. And to turn back to the Earth example, here is a video of this process happening in Greenland, a very similar process. What you're looking at is Jakobshavn Glacier as icebergs calve from the front of the glacier, turn over, and exist. There you go, big, big iceberg flipping over and floating around in a matrix of broken up brash ice, which is rich in water, but still really a solid. So this is what it might look like on Europa if we were witnessing it relatively uh, live. So um, Tom Wagner is going to tell you a little bit more about the Earth's frozen environments. Yeah, and if we could have the first slide. I thought we'd start with just a really brief description of ice shelves, which as Brittany pointed out, is probably our best analog for what's happened with the ice on Europa. And what happens is this, you take a place like Greenland or Antarctica, you build up a lot of ice and snow in the middle until it literally gets miles thick. And then it begins to flow out to the sides, just like if I poured honey on the table right here, how it would flow out. 
Well, what happens when that ice hits the ocean is it begins to float. And that floating glacier is what an ice shelf is. They can be many hundreds of feet thick. They can extend out many, many, many miles, hundreds of miles in some cases. In fact, the Ross Ice Shelf is the size of France in Antarctica. Next slide. But ice shelves are also remarkably dynamic features. Most people had thought they were kind of stable, but here we saw in 2008, the Wilkins Ice Shelf in Antarctica, literally over the course of a couple of weeks, it blew apart in one of what my colleagues describes as the mosh pit. And what happened was this ice, as it flowed out, it got a little thinner. Eventually, it triggered a collapse, which then triggered a further collapse. And it tumbled away like giant dominoes. Next slide. Some of these dominoes, though, are miles long and hundreds of feet thick. And they turn over and rotate. And also, as Brittany pointed out, that matrix material that we see on Europa probably would look something like this, which is brash ice, which is the broken up bits that fill in beneath these, between these bergs as they bump into each other. Next slide. This process is profoundly important for us on Earth also. And this example is the Larsen Ice Shelf, which is on the Antarctic Peninsula that extends up towards South America. In 2002, an area the size of Rhode Island again collapsed just over the course of a couple of weeks. Picture giant tablets just tumbling away, things hundreds of feet thick, right? Over a giant, like as big as a US state. What happened, though, that was so remarkable was that the glaciers on the land behind it, off to the left side of the screen that you're looking at, they sped up dramatically as you kind of popped the cork or pulled away this ice shelf. Some of them increased their speed eightfold. They went so fast that they drained all the ice that was behind them, and the surface deflated by over 150 feet in some cases, over 600 feet in other cases, just over the course of five or six years. So this is really important, because when we try to project future sea level rise on the planet, we think that this is probably the most dynamic element that we have to take into account, because there's ice shelves all around Antarctica. Next slide. And this is one of the most important ice shelves for that sea level rise work that I spoke about. This is the Pine Island Glacier Ice Shelf. And this is, we have studied these processes in great detail. And one thing you should realize is that it's not a huge extrapolation to go from what we're doing on Earth to Europa, because we have satellites and aircraft where we can study these things all the way down to the base levels. In this case, what you're looking at, the gray is the surface of the ice shelf, which was shot by LIDAR from an aircraft, literally a little laser rastering over the surface. Underneath that, the next layer, that kind of mountainous colored stuff, is the base of the ice shelf, which was with radar. As amazing as it sounds, we can put a radar under an airplane and map the structure of the ice and the bottom of the ice. Under there would be the ocean. And then the bottom is actually the sea floor, which we map by a gravimeter. It's really important to us because, again, like the Europa case, where you have warm water that's causing melting and fracturing in things, what our big fear on Earth is that warm water in the ocean is getting underneath these ice shelves and destabilizing them. And what we have to do is we have to get the topography of the under ice shelf, we have to get the topography of the seafloor to understand how coastal waters mix in. Next slide. But the last slide that I want to show you is actually a radar image over a subglacial lake, literally like one of these perched lakes we're talking about on Europa. In Antarctica, there are over 140 of these lakes. It's, it was shocking to me. I started working in the Antarctic world probably about seven or eight years ago, and we didn't really know there was that much water around. And now through radar studies like this, that vertical scale is about four kilometers. And you see the flat line in the bottom? That's where the radar waves have bounced off the surface of the lake. That lake is the size of Lake Ontario. And with that, I'll pass off to Tori, who's going to tell us about habitability on Europa. Thanks, Tom. So one of the things that makes Europa so exciting, that has made it such a compelling object of study for decades, is the presence of this liquid water ocean that meets one of the critical requirements for life. And what you're hearing about today from Brittany bears on a second of life's crucial requirements, and that is the requirement for energy. So habitability is a concept that we all can relate to personal experience as living organisms. Anybody on the street could give you a pretty good accounting of what it takes to stay alive, water, food, shelter, air to breathe. So if we think about these things in the context of Europa, there is absolutely no shortage of water there. That we know and have known for more than a decade. As far as we know, the environment is relatively sheltering if we think about shelter as the set of conditions that allow life to persist in an environmental context. Most of what we can, see, can conceive as a potential European ocean chemistry would be reasonably suitable for life. But the big and open question has been one of energy. And when we talk about food to eat and air to breathe, what we're really talking about is our requirement for energy. And I've tried to conceptualize how to, how to think of this in terms of a figure. So you could view Europa as something like a great big battery. It's stored energy. And the question has been whether or not that stored energy is actually available for life on Europa. 
So if you took a, a, a normal D cell battery and cut it away, what you would see is chemically different layers that are isolated from one another. It's energy that's stored. And the way to tap that energy, as you can see in the second slide, is to connect the terminals. When you connect the terminals with a wire, electrons flow from place to place. That flow of electrons is what we call electricity. But in essence, what's happening is a movement of material from the outer layer to the inner layer that serves to release energy. So in the next slide, you can see that we can view Europa in much the same way. We know from spacecraft observations of surface chemistry, from inference of the chemistry of Europa's crust, that it represents, in essence, stored energy. But with this big, thick 10 kilometer or more ice shell, the big open question has been, does that energy ever get released? Is it ever available in the ocean? What you're hearing about here today, if we can have the last slide, would be a way to take this surface material, transport it potentially down into the ocean, and in essence, tap Europa's battery. And when you tap that battery, you've moved from a system that checks one of the requirements for life to a system that checks a second critical requirement for life. And I think this really impacts the way that we consider habitability on Europa. So how should we view this in the big context of European ocean exploration? Uh, I think Louise is the person to address this. Thank you, sorry. Uh, well, this new model is very uh, exciting in many respects because it ties together a lot of loose ends uh, from Europa studies that have spanned most of the last decade. Uh, here in the first slide, I'm showing uh, a figure that uh, represents two previous models for Europa's shell. Uh, the one on the left shows the uh, ocean and the ice shell. The total thickness of this is about 150 kilometers. Uh, but here, the shell is depicted as being very thin, maybe only uh, five kilometers or less. And the plumes that you're seeing here would be um, in the ocean. They're hydrothermal plumes from the uh, floor, from where the ocean floor meets the mantle of Europa. Uh, on the right-hand side is a, a depiction of a thicker shell model, where the shell here would be about 15 to 30 kilometers. It's not quite to scale. Uh, but the underlying plumes uh, from the ocean floor would impinge on the bottom of the ice shell and would warm it, uh, and as such would create plumes within the shell. These are convective plumes, so it's actually um, solid material that is mobilized because it's slightly warmer than the surrounding. So similar to what you would see in a, a saucepan of bubbling soup. I'm told miso soup does this very well. Uh, but you can see different convection cells and material moves upwards in the center and down at the margins. And these two models have been um, used to explain some of the observations we've seen on the surface of Europa. Uh, but neither of them have been able to explain everything we see. And that's been a big problem for us. Uh, but with the new model that Brittany and her colleagues have put together, we can now explain pretty much every geological observation that we see surrounding chaos on Europa. So it's really sort of come along and, and joined together a lot of dots. So we're, we're very happy uh, to see that. Um, next, I want to talk about the distribution uh, of chaos and its age. Um, if you look at this image uh, of Europa, you can see that uh, the surface looks very different from, say, the surface of uh, the Moon or Mercury. Um, those bodies are very heavily uh, impact cratered. They've got a lot of cratering scars on them. Uh, whereas Europa, you can see, has uh, hardly any. In fact, I'm not sure you can even make any out at this scale. Now, we use the number of impact craters on the surface of a body as a proxy for age. We assume that things like comets and meteorites that are coming into a system impact the surface on a fairly constant basis. And so if something has a lot of them, that means that it's been sitting there getting this uh, weathering process for a very long time. Whereas if something doesn't have many craters, it's probably very young. And in the case of Europa, something has happened to erase the impact scars from the surface. Uh, and in this case, it could be tectonic features, so faults and fractures on the surface that could uh, erase whatever has come before. It could be some kind of cryovolcanism, and it certainly could be chaos. So if we can start the movie, please. Um, and in fact, the average age of Europa is thought to only be about 60 million years. Now, on human timescales, that's a very long time. But in geological timescales, that's a blink of an eye. It was almost born yesterday on the surface. Um, so Europa already has a very young uh, surface age. And here we're zooming into um, Thera macula on the left, which Brittany uh, talked about earlier, and uh, a chaos very close to it, Thrace macula on the right. And as you can see, they're both quite large. Uh, Thera is about 80 kilometers, maybe a little over 50 miles across. Um, and notice that these are very different from their surroundings. They're both very dark. They have uh, unusual scalloped margins. Uh, they don't look like a lot of the long linear features that we see that appear to be faults and fractures. And these two arrows are pointing towards a semicircular uh, fracture system uh, 
uh, that was once intact. We're looking at the two sides of it. And you can see that thrace macula on the right has actually uh, disrupted the middle of that. It's completely destroyed it, in fact. And so this shows that this chaos region overlies those tectonic features, and so it's much younger. So what we're showing here is not only uh, is Europa's surface young, but chaos is very young still. And in fact, it's one of the youngest uh, feature types, if not the major young landform on the surface. So it's very, very young. Here I'm just uh, zooming out, showing you the equator. Um, there's a big X uh, just off the centre to the left. Uh, just to the south of that is Connemara chaos, which Brittany also mentioned earlier. But you can see all this brown mottled material over the surface. All of that is chaos terrain. It's very widespread. Um, in fact, we think you know, estimates vary uh, because we don't have particularly good imaging data of much of Europa, but we think it could be as much as 50% of the surface has been completely destroyed in recent times by this chaos formation. And so to summarize, um, this is a very important result because first of all, it draws together many of the conflicting observations uh, that we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, but secondly, it shows that there could be these huge hidden lakes in Europa's shell, uh, widespread bodies of water maybe taking up as much as half of the upper shell of Europa. And so chaos regions are, are going to be extremely important as possible future targets for exploration. And with that, I'll pass back to Dwayne. Thank you. Thank you all. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start here with a question. And if you can wait for the microphone and give your name and affiliation. And then we'll uh, go to the phone lines. Sir? Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS, a newspaper of the American Geophysical Union. Um, this is very interesting information. And so I, I guess I have sort of a basic question. I'd appreciate if you could um, describe further uh, the other models that you um, uh, investigated and explored and perhaps discarded. Uh, what are the weaknesses in those models for describing Europa? And do you believe that the model that you've uh, outlined today is the only model that now is useful in uh, describing Europa sufficiently? Or could there potentially be other models uh, that might be useful here? Well, certainly. Um, <clears throat> for a long time, we've thought that chaos terrain is formed in the presence of some amount of water. Uh, one of the key unknowns is how you get those surfaces like Connemara Chaos to actually produce domes up above the surface. It's actually very hard to do with most models. Uh, there have been a couple of models suggested. I'll highlight two of them. One is that you completely melt the ice shell um, and that, that the matrix material represents places where liquid water flowed on the surface. That has some problems just because of the cold surface temperatures of Europa and because other observations of Europa suggest that the shell is incredibly thick. Um, on the other hand, there's been models of convection and diapurism where the goal was to try to look at if plumes could survive up into the surface ice to cause that doming. Well, if you relax that constraint and think about what happens when ice actually gets heated, is it melts. And so, in fact, the opposite of what, what originally was the goal happens. And that, as the ice melts, it contracts and causes the surface to depress. But what that also does is it gives a chance for the surface to break up, to fracture, just like ice shelves on the Earth. Why that's important is that we see icebergs on Europa seem to follow pre-existing lines, fractures that already existed. So it's like it's being opened up from the bottom Water's getting in there and breaking off those chunks of ice. When you do that, you mix up all the other stuff. We mentioned a mosh pit of ice earlier. As those big, strong icebergs move around, they can break up all of the weak ice in between, which can fill with water, still not be liquid, but fill with water. As you freeze that out, the expansion happens again. So just as the ice, when it melted, caused thermal contraction, when it refreezes, it causes thermal expansion. And that gives you the extra boost needed to kind of pop that surface back up into a dome. Because you've entrained uh, salt-rich water into that matrix material, creating that kind of lumpy texture on the surface. So it's not the only model that's out there, but one of the exciting things about it is that it does kind of explain why we see icebergs, which might seem to, think, seem to make you think that the ice shell is thin, but also, this matrix material in these domes, which indicate the ice shell is thick. OK. Let's go to the phone lines. And we're going to head out to the West Coast with David Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. David? 
Hey, thanks very much. Uh, just two questions quickly. Uh, one is, and NASA seems to have placed a priority in the search for life on, life on these uh, Jovian moons and others, and uh, Enceladus and Titan seem to be the higher priority targets. Are you people making a pitch for uh, uh, more attention being paid to Europa? Uh, and if so, how do you make that pitch besides uh, a, a forum like this? And incidentally, is this theory about chaos terrain uh, being published or has it been published in the literature? And I'll take the answer right now. Well, I think what we're saying is that Europa continues to be an interesting priority uh, for exploration, which it has been for for 30 years or more. Um, yes, the, the paper has been published. Um, it was just released, advanced online publication by Nature uh, today, and will appear in the print version um, of the magazine next week. Can I just add to that? Um, the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, published a decadal survey for uh, exploration, which uh, was the science community giving NASA its suggested priorities for exploration over the next decade. Uh, and I was actually part of the satellites panel that looked at both Titan and Europa. And they are both considered to be extremely important targets uh, and both have astrobiological potential for different reasons. Uh, but at this time, uh, that panel felt that Europa uh, was more compelling, partly because uh, Titan does need some technology development uh, to do certain types of missions there. So they are both very important targets, but at this time it was felt that, uh, you know, the recommendation from that panel was that perhaps Europa uh, was uh, of a higher priority at the moment. Okay, I actually have uh, two questions here. The first one is for uh, Brittany from one of the dot coms and then for Tom Wagner. So the, the question is very simple. What are the next steps with uh, presenting this and the data that you have now? I'm glad to answer that question. Um, for us, the next steps with understanding chaos formation and whether this lake model really is correct is to look at the entire surface. There's still data to be used uh, in the Galileo archives um, that we can use to compare this model to other models and really rigorously test it. And then, um, and then we'll be ready to go on and test hypotheses in the future with exploration. Um, the other question from one of the uh, dot coms. As, as the Earth scientists, uh, personally, what are your feelings on, on, on what you're seeing here and how it relates to your research? Oh, I think it's fantastic. You know, we don't have that many of these examples, even on the Earth, of ice shelves collapsing. So anytime we can go and see something like this, and also the scale is tremendous. You know, that's one of the things, the Europa scale is a little bit bigger. But that, in the future, may be something that's more relevant to us here on Earth. So I think it's an exciting research example for us to continue to work together on. Do you have any other questions here? Go ahead. Yeah, I guess I'd just like to follow up on that last question that, that was asked in your response. Um, um, during your presentation, you talk a lot about what the Earth might uh, help us to, how, how the Earth might help us to understand Europa. If you can uh, elaborate a little bit more on how Europa might help us to understand more about Earth processes. Yeah, sure. You know, one of the big things is we're, we're kind of in a new state on the planet, you know? And when we try to understand, say, the Pine Island, Area. And we try to understand that large, large, large ice shelf and how it's going to interact with the, uh, with the ocean. How, like, one of the theories right now is this, that you've got um, lack of sea ice and anomalous winds blowing warm water up onto the continental shelf around Antarctica. And that's causing the ice shelves to thin. And that's causing some of them to destabilize and break up. Well, we've seen that happen, but we've only seen it happen right now in kind of small places around the fringe. How is it going to happen in bigger places? You know, what's going to happen is that warm water gets in deeper. And so something that we're going to get are just simple things even like geometric constraints, right? Like, you know, what's going to happen to a really thick area as it breaks up? And something that I didn't talk that much about, the Wilkins ice shelf that I showed first, the reason for show that's so interesting is that it was kind of mechanical breakup in that the ice shelf had flowed out. And as it flows out in the ocean, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. Just like I say, picture it like spreading pancake batter. You know, it just gets thinner as it goes out. And then eventually it destabilizes and breaks up and it triggers. With the Larsen ice shelf case, one of the theories is that you had surface melting. So you had warming of the surrounding area, water formed. And then kind of like the Europa example, except kind of in the reverse way, 
That water percolated down, forced its way through cracks, created cracks, destabilized the ice shelf, and it could break apart along those things. So there's, you know, those are kind of two end member cases that we're trying to test between. And Europa is now another example for us to think about. OK. What we're going to do is, uh, actually, they've done such a great job uh, explaining it. Uh, we have no further questions on the line, although we have numerous media that are listening in. So I want to thank you all for joining us. Obviously, information, go to www.nasa.gov. And thanks for joining us. Science never sleeps.